Hey everyone, nuclear chemistry. So this is Mrs. T's Chem Talk for Nuclear Chemistry. And in case you don't know who I am, I'm Elizabeth Tuminello. I'm a chemistry teacher at Calhoun High School in Merrick, New York. So the first thing that we talk about in nuclear chemistry is going to be stability. And some atoms are stable and other atoms are not stable. Something that would be stable, its stability is based on the neutron to proton ratio. A ratio of one neutron for every one proton is the most stable for a nucleus. And an unstable nucleus will emit, which means give off, rays or particles. When it does this, it will become more stable as a result. Anything that is unstable will spontaneously decay in a natural reaction. So if an atom has an unstable nucleus, meaning it doesn't have a neutron to proton ratio close to one to one, it will spontaneously decay in a natural reaction and give off something like alpha particles, beta particles, positrons, or gamma rays. We have table O that helps us in this chapter. We should notice that on table O, we have our notations that we're going to use in our nuclear reactions. And these notations um, have our mass numbers on the top and our atomic numbers on the bottom. And some of them even include a charge. We're going to use table O as our good friend here to make sure that we always know what the symbol and notations are for the different types of radiation involved in nuclear chemistry. For alpha decay, that would be one type of natural transmutation. Remember, transmutation is when we have an atom of one element spit something out of its nucleus or emit something from its nucleus and turn into another element. So for example, francium-220, it says that it has a decay mode of alpha decay. So what that means, we're going to first write francium-220. Then we're always going to do francium-220 by itself before the arrow. Only one species before the arrow because this is going to be natural transmutation. Table N is for natural nuclear. So everything that we have listed on table N undergoes natural nuclear decay, which means that it's the only species before the arrow. We then look on the periodic table to make sure what the atomic number is that we're going to write in here. So I put an 87 at the bottom. And then I look at table O to find what an alpha particle looks like. So the next thing I do after the arrow is write the symbol for an alpha particle. Once I have my symbol for my alpha particle written in, I can fill in the rest of this as if it was a math equation. Remember that the arrow is like an equal sign for us. So 220 has to equal 4 plus something. And 4 plus 216 is 220. 87 equals 2 plus 85. That means that what francium-220 turns into or transmutates into as a result of its alpha decay has a mass number of 216 and an atomic number of 85. I then look to the periodic table and find the symbol for the element that has an atomic number of 85 and that completes my equation for the alpha decay of francium-220. For beta decay, for example, Gold-198 has a B- minus as its decay mode, so that means it undergoes beta decay. So that means if I want to draw or write the equation for the decay of gold-198, I write the symbol for gold with a mass number of 198. I look on the periodic table for gold's atomic number and fill it in there. My arrow is an equal sign, and my first my first product after the arrow will be one of these notations here for a beta particle. I can do 0 minus 1e e or 0 over minus 1 beta 
I usually prefer the zero over minus one e because it comes first, but you could see or use either one. Remember that the arrow is like an equal sign, so 198 equals zero plus 198. 79 equals negative one plus 80. So that means that the atomic number for the species that gold 198 turns into by getting rid of a uh, beta particle has a mass number of 198 and an atomic number of 80. I look up atomic number 80 on the periodic table and I fill in the symbol for mercury. This means that gold 198 spontaneously emits a beta particle and turns into a nucleus of mercury 198. Transmutation because we switched what element we have and natural because it happens alone. For positron decay, we would see on table N this B plus. And so calcium 37 undergoes positron decay. So that means that calcium 37 is by itself before the arrow because again, this is a type of natural transmutation. I look up the atomic number for calcium to fit it in. I find on table O the notation for a positron. Fill that in as one of my products. I use the arrow like an equal sign to fill in the other product. 37 equals zero plus 37. 20 equals one plus 19. I look up element number 19 on the periodic table and fill in the symbol. So calcium 37 transmutates into potassium 37 by emitting or spitting out a positron. It's natural because calcium 37 is the only reactant before the arrow and it's transmutation because I have different symbols on each side. If we have different types of radiation, we can separate them by an electric field because since beta particles are negative, they would attract a positive plate. Since alpha particles are positive, they would attract a negative plate. And since gamma rays are neutral, they could not be separated by charge at all. When we talk about something called penetrating power, we're talking about how much can something go through. This is the symbol for alpha. Alpha has the weakest penetrating power. It can be stopped by tissue, like body tissue. This is the symbol for beta. Beta has a stronger penetrating power than alpha. It can be stopped by aluminum, a thin sheet of aluminum. And this is the symbol for gamma. Gamma can go through almost everything. It has the strongest penetrating power, and gamma needs a thick sheet of lead in order to stop it. When we talk about half-life, half-life is known as the time it takes for half of a radioactive sample to decay to more stable products. Half-life time remains the same. Nothing can change the length of a half-life for a certain radioisotope. We have selected half-life information found on table N, and a question for half-life might look like this. How much of a 100 gram sample of cesium-137 will remain unchanged after 90.6 years? When you see a question asking about something that will remain unchanged, something with a symbol and a mass number, and an amount of time, you're going to use table N to look up the time for one half-life and use this process. So on table N, it says that cesium-137 has a half-life of 30.2 years. So I like to do a little mental calculation and say, okay, 90.6 divided by 30.2, and I get an answer. And I notice that three half-life periods have gone by if we allow 90.6 years to go by. So if three half-life periods are going to go by, that means that the 100 gram sample divides in half one, two, three times. Every time a half-life period goes by, the amount of unchanged isotope divides in half. 
So we have one half-life making it be 50 grams left over. The second half-life gets us to 25 grams left over. The third half-life period gets us to 12 and a half grams left over. And each half-life period is 30.2 years, which gives us our total of 90.6 years going by. When we talk about artificial transmutation, artificial transmutation is not spontaneous. It does not happen on its own. This happens when a somewhat stable nucleus decays into a different element after being bombarded with a high energy particle. So remember, we have to actually hit the nucleus with something at, going at tremendous speed with a tremendous amount of energy in order to make this particle unstable. So there will always be two or more reactants in an artificial transmutation reaction showing that they have to be hit together. And an example would be if aluminum 27 is usually stable, but we hit it with a high energy alpha particle, right, two reactants, this aluminum turns into phosphorus 30 and gives off a neutron. So it only happens if we bombard it or hit it with this other particle. Otherwise, aluminum 27 will go around, will go along and um, doesn't really go along at all, but otherwise aluminum 27 will not change into something else. It has to be hit or bombarded first. Fission is going to be a type of artificial transmutation reaction, and it happens when a fairly large nucleus splits after capturing a high energy neutron. So again, it has to be bombarded or hit with this high energy neutron to cause it to split. If we keep this reaction in control, because it gives off so much energy, it can be used for, that would be like this, so fission. We have our neutron being captured by our uranium-235 nucleus, which makes it unstable and makes it split into two smaller pieces, giving off a lot of energy plus more neutrons. If we allow this to get out of control, we can cause a chain reaction, and if that chain reaction is allowed to get out of control, it can, be, it can cause an explosion, which would be used in a fission bomb. So if we look here, we have these neutrons coming off, and if they are allowed to continuously hit more atoms, as those atoms split, they give off more and more neutrons, and eventually, the amount of splitting atoms at a time gets so far out of control and it gives off so much energy at once that it causes a nuclear explosion. Fusion, on the other hand, is uh, what happens when we unite two very small nuclei into one larger nucleus. It requires tremendous pressure and heat because we must overcome the repulsive forces. Each nucleus that we're trying to bring together repels each other because each nucleus is positive. This type of reaction happens on the sun. It's where we get our energy from to power the earth. And some of the example equations would be if you just see the hydrogen two plus hydrogen two makes helium, that's one example of fusion. Another example of fusion you might see is hydrogen three which is called tritium, plus hydrogen 2, which is called deuterium, making this helium nucleus, but then we also have a neutron given off. So sometimes you see those two reactions for fusion. Nuclear reactions, remember, give off tremendous amounts of energy, and all nuclear reactions give off much more energy than chemical reactions, and this is because in a nuclear reaction, some of the mass is actually converted into energy. This does not happen for a regular chemical reaction. So fission, fusion, any of the types of decay we talked about, natural transmutation, artificial transmutation, all give off tremendous amounts of energy because they have this mass converted into energy. Um, another thing that you should be aware of are the benefits and risks for nuclear chemistry in general. Nuclear reactions provide a lot more energy, a lot of energy for electric power. That's a benefit. They can be used to trace reactions or find out how a chemical reaction happens. They can be used for medical diagnosis. They can also be used for medical treatments. They can be used to make food fresh longer. And we also have the process of processes of radioactive dating. Uranium-238 is used to date never-living things. 
or non-living things, and carbon-14 is used to date things that were once living. We also, on the other hand, have some risks. Biological damage, radiation can cause mutations and sicknesses. We have an issue in long-term storage. Products of fission for nuclear power plants take a long time to decay to save radiation levels and continually give off radiation until they're done decaying. Accidents can happen. Fuel and waste can escape from a nuclear reactor. We read the article, if you're in my class, about Chernobyl and about Fukushima, about those particular accidents and how those sites are still giving off radiation and are causing environmental, causing environmental damage. And pollution, we know that people can be harmed by too much radioactive waste. So these are our benefits and risks that we should be aware of. This was the nuclear chemistry review video for Mrs. T's Chem Talk. Hopefully it was helpful. Um, if you have any more questions and you're one of my students, please feel free to stop by Extra Help or send me an email or a remind message. And if you're looking for um, some other videos to help you out, um, happy studying.